Good morning, everybody. Pastor Armando here. I'm the lead pastor of Fusion Church. If you're joining us online, in person, or podcast, we have a great message for you guys today. We are in the fifth and final part of our message series entitled Anchored. And I got to tell you guys, I'm sorry to see this message series go, but I so needed it. This, This year has been, this last year, the beginning of this year has been crazy. And what I've recognized is that there is a, there's an absence of peace in this world. Everywhere I look, everybody I talk to, every piece of news I listen to, there's an absolute absence of peace. It's nowhere to be found. And, and you know, this message series has brought life to me because I've realized that there are some truths. There are some things you and I have anchored into, can anchor into, that could really make the difference of how you and I live this life how you and I experience the pain we're in. How many of you know I, you, are not a victim of this life? Life is hard, but God did not create you to be a victim, but an overcomer. Why? Because he overcame. A survivor. Why? Because he rose from the dead. With him we will rise too. To be able to have the hope of the world, and we have it in our hearts and on our lips and in our minds. Man, I learned in this message series that when the world changes, His Word never changes. I can anchor deep into the Word of God. It never changes. You know, it was so encouraging to me, part two of this message series, I learned that when I'm in a mess, God anchors into me. And how many of you know, no matter where you're at today, no matter what you're struggling with, your mess is like a magnet. It magnetizes Jesus. He comes after you in your mess. Scripture tells us that he leaves the 99 and he goes looking for that one. Jesus is looking for you. He's looking for me today. And that's a truth I can anchor into that when I feel lost, he will find me. He will find me. I'll never forget when I was a kid, my, um, man, my parents left my little sister at a gas station and drove away. Seriously, no joke, they drove away. And, and I kind of knew it, and I was like, yes, finally. <laughs> and then, the, but the car was really silent. It was like really, really silent. It was like so peaceful. And then my mom was like, where's Christina, my little sister? She's not here in service today. And my dad was like, I think we left her at the, at the ghost station. And my mom blew a gasket, and they roll up, and sure enough, my sister was there. And you know what? <laughs> I haven't thought about that in years. That was so good. That was so good. That just like a good loving parent goes back to that gas station to find their troublemaker, God comes looking for you and I, magnetizes God. Man, we can anchor into community. Do you know the church is God's plan A for this world? It's to be light when you're living in darkness, to be provision when you're in need. When you're crying, what does the church do? They, we're supposed to cry with you. When you're celebrating, rather than hating on you and scrolling past you, we're supposed to like that and celebrate with you. That's right. That's right? Right. The church is there for you and for me. It, it's, it's a community that I can anchor into on my best of days. And when the church is done right, when the church has the cross at its center, I can be real with the church, and on my worst of days, I can anchor into that community. And it's supposed to be a place that will accept you, a place that will love you, a place that will empower you, a place for you to belong, to believe, to become. You guys like the promo? That's Fusion Church Mission right there. I have spiritual gifts that you and I can anchor into. Not only are you not a victim, but you are empowered by the Holy Spirit, which I am so pumped and excited to, to just dive into our next message series, Wind and Fire, and we're going to learn all about this. But, but I'm going to tell you, God has given you weapons, some serious divine weapons to wage war. Yeah. To wage war. And today we're going to talk about anchoring into peace. And you know, peace doesn't originate from this world. This world is beautiful, but it could be really ugly. Peace doesn't originate with you and I. If it did, you and I would be fixed. Who's fixed in here? Raise your hand. Said nobody ever, right? Now you might say, hey, but pastor, I can go away. And when I meditate, I experience peace. Sure. When we get away from the world, I can go on vacation too. And we experience temporary peace. And and there is a temporary peace that's part of self-care, isn't there? And that's healthy and it's good. And that comes through meditation for some of us. It comes through music. It comes through scripture reading. It comes through reading a fantasy book. And maybe you're on a Netflix series. Man, who watched Cobra Kai? 
I was on that. I watched season three all in 10 hours. Okay, the first day it came out, it was dope. Watch it, Cobra Kai. Anyway, so, man, you know, when we take those breaks from life, we, we experience peace in those moments. But the truth is, when we get back into life, we're dealing with life again. But see, Jesus promises you and I a peace that surpasses understanding. Something you and I can't explain, that when you're in your mess, yet his presence is in you. His peace is with you, and somehow he empowers you and I to get through that mess. And we are in a mess, guys. We're still in a pandemic, no surprise. We literally just got off of a season of crazy politics. Some of us are still unfriended by certain people. All right? You lost friends. I hear you. Family conflict is at an all-time high. Some of us have experienced significant losses, mental health issues. And this season, we've lost so much. You know, I was thinking about my kids. I was thinking about many of you, and I was thinking about proms and graduations and colleges. I think the only good news that came out of this pandemic, my daughter Alex, who's graduating, is like the first senior in history that got into college without an, without an SAT. Like, that's kind of cool, right? That's like the only good news. But if, she, if you're listening, I don't really know if she's going to college, because I don't know if they're doing that, right? This season has taken so much from us. And some of us in those difficulties, see, when we go through pain, for some of us, that's where your faith goes to die. Think about that. When you're in pain, that's where your faith goes to die because it begs the question, God, you didn't work. God, you didn't fulfill those promises that that pastor shared with me that I've heard Sunday after Sunday. God, I I prayed for my aunt who was dying of cancer and I thought you were going to heal her and she died. God, I prayed that this pandemic would end. How many of you prayed for this pandemic to end? Is it. still here. Like, isn't, isn't prayer supposed to work? God, where are you? And sometimes God allows you and I to go through a season of silence. Sometimes God allows you to feel all alone. And I started dealing with that this week. God, why do I so often feel alone? And you know what was ministered to me? Because when you're alone, only then do you realize you don't need anyone else to fulfill what only I can. You see, sometimes alone is a gift. Sometimes silence is a gift because in my life, silence has brought me to my knees and I met God in ways that only silence could do. The mountaintop, it's not really where we grow. And the truth is, God has often used silence throughout history. You see, there's a gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, between Malachi and the Gospels, and it's about a 450-year gap of prophetic silence. Leadership, silence. And the people were an oppressed people. Israel was under occupation and oppression by the Roman Empire, which was like the whole known world at the time. And they believed Yeshua, they believed Messiah would come. He would overthrow, topple our adversaries. 450 years of silence. God, where are you? We've prayed. Generation after generation has passed. 400 years or so, Israel was in slavery to, in Egypt, and only after a great length of time did Moses finally show up. Did God finally send him? God, why the extended period of silence? So there's this guy in uh, Luke chapter 1 named Zechariah, and he's married to Elizabeth. These are the parents of John the Baptist, right? And, and what's amazing is in this, in this story, He's praying for a son. Him and his wife are older in years. He's praying for a child, period. And, and they were without child. And they prayed and prayed, and finally, he got an answer from heaven. After a long time of praying, all he heard was silence, and then an angel shows up, like a legit angel. And the angel's talking to him. And the angel was like, Zechariah, your, your prayers have been heard by God, and I was sent from heaven, and you are going to have a son, and his name is going to be John, and he's going to pave the way for the Messiah, the one you've been praying for. And then Zechariah, rather than celebrating, you know what he does? He goes into doubt mode. And he says, how do I know what you're saying is real and going to happen? And this, this angel almost backslapped him. I kid you not. He was like, what? Dude, I came from heaven. I'm an angel. And he's like, but you don't have wings. I don't see the white robe. You know, sometimes God answers your prayers, but it comes in packages you don't always expect, doesn't it? Sometimes it, 
God, it wasn't supposed to feel that way. It wasn't supposed to look that way. God, I asked you to help me grow spiritually and all you sent me was pain. God, I asked you to help me mature in my walk and my walk just got harder. God, I asked you to fix my marriage and we just fight more and more and now we need to go to counseling. Like, Sometimes the journey is the answer. Sometimes the work, the silence, the difficulty, the pain, the mess you're in is actually the blessing. Sometimes it's the catalyst that brings about what you've always wanted. So, rather than backslapping him, the angel's like, dude, you're not going to say a word until what I have told you is fulfilled. He was made mute. He was made silent. He is in a mess right now. By the way, he was a teacher. He was like a, he was like a priest, and now he couldn't speak. And, and this chapter goes on, and it almost feels like a musical, because then Mary goes to visit, talks to Elizabeth. She breaks out in musical song. Then, then John... John the Baptist, which Baptist is not his last name, but like he was born, Zechariah finally speaks, breaks out in song. It's legit, legitimately like a, a Broadway show. So we're going to pick up Luke chapter 1, 67. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of your servant David. Redeemed means to be purchased, to be bought back. Salvation means to be rescued and set free. So what did Jesus come for? The Prince of Peace. He came to redeem you, to pay your debt, and to set you free. So many of us, we don't want the Prince of Peace. We want Jesus to be the Prince of my wants the prince of my comforts, the prince of my ease. And you know what? When he fails our expectation, we get frustrated, we get angry, we doubt the things of God, and our faith goes somewhere to die. Yeah. But in reality, what was Jesus' primary job for you? To give you a hope and a future, to bring you from death to life, to save you from hell, to give you a position in heaven. That was his primary ministry here on earth to set the captives free. But, but you and I, man, we take some of that for granted, even as believers. We're like, okay, cool, I got a relationship with Jesus. Cool, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. But Jesus, I need and I want that new car. Jesus, I need and I want that house. Why can't I pay my bills? God, you don't work. Like, seriously? The prince of my peace or the prince of my ease? Some of us want the prince of our ease. So Zechariah, man, he, he goes on. We're going to jump to 76. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord and prepare a way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in, say in, in, in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit. You see, that's a perspective shift. Isn't God supposed to save me from my problems? You see, so many of us, we want God to take us out of our problems, but that's not often how God works. God actually rescues you in the problems. He enters into your pain, into your difficulty, into your hardship, but he doesn't pluck you out. But, but God, that's not how I want it. God, I, I, I don't want it this way. I don't want to go through grief. I don't want to go through loss. I don't want to be on my knees praying for my children. I don't want to be on my knees praying for my family member who's on a ventilator because they have COVID. Like, God, I don't want to go through all that. But his promise wasn't from, his promise was in. Yeah. In your pain, in my pain, to shine on those living in darkness, in the shadow of death. And I love this part, to guide our feet onto the path of peace. And that inspires our message title, In the Presence of Peace. Because some of you have come in here today, in person, online, podcast, and you need to understand something. You thought you were in a mess. You thought you were in a storm. But really, you're in the presence of peace. And this is something that I struggle with, guys. I'm not going to lie to you. I do. But let's try to understand a little bit about what peace is. Peace is absence or freedom for, from disturbance. It's tranquility. That's what Webster says. But biblical, the biblical definition of peace. 
is more than just the absence of conflict. It is taking action to restore what has been broken or a broken situation. It's more than a state. Say more. It's more than a state of inner tranquility. It's a state of wholeness and completeness. Biblical peace is not something we can create on our own. It is a fruit of the Spirit. This word shalom, we call him uh, Jehovah Shalom, God of my peace. What, What that word really means for us is a realm where chaos cannot enter in. It's a promise of God that, man, there might be a mess around me. The world might be on fire. Everybody's in a pandemic. But what's outside is not getting inside because I have the peace of God in my life. Shalom. Inner, inner peace by the presence of God. But guys, this is something I have struggled with severely for the last 10 to 12 years. I struggle with peace all the time. I'm a very, by nature, I'm a restless person. And about 10, 12 years ago, for the first time ever, I didn't know what the heck was happening. I thought I was going nuts. I ended up getting seasonal affective disorder for the first time. And I didn't know. All of a sudden, one morning I, I woke up and I felt dead inside. It was the craziest thing. And and I'm also a mental health professional. I worked with uh, depressed clients for more than a decade. And for the first time in my life, I understood what they meant. And I didn't know it was seasonal affective disorder. I thought I just stepped into something I don't want to be part of. So I was depressed. I was anxious. And then all of a sudden, March rolls around, April, and it lifted. And I felt the joy of the Lord again. And then the next year rolls around. And it was kind of a fluke. I was like, what was that? Must have been because i somewhere in my 30s, right, at that time. It's age. It was age. So the next year came. Holidays ended, and I took a nosedive. I plummeted, and I blamed it on everything and everyone, and I thought all the holidays are over. And you know what happened? Then the end of January came. Then February came, and I was depressed, and I started to look at this. I said, okay, now we have some history here. Honey... My wife, I think I have seasonal affective disorder. Uh, And some of us call it the winter blues, winter depression, hibernation syndrome. Like I put on 15 pounds and I wasn't happy. Food wasn't fixing my problems. And I was depressed. And you know what? If you've ever gone through depression, you know what I mean. Uh, Man, some days were so bad I just felt numb. I I, I didn't feel happy, certainly. And, And I didn't even feel depressed and sad anymore. I just felt numb inside. And the numb was such an awkward, weird feeling that I actually wished to feel depressed because at least then I felt something. And I felt nothing. And, and you know what? I'm like, God, where are your promises? Do you know how much I prayed? How much I'm even praying today? February's around the corner. I've literally been feeling the seasonal blues. since This year it started early. I don't know why. started at the end of November, beginning of December. And I've been feeling the blues. But you know, it's funny how God redeems our pain. He does. I, I will tell you this. I may not feel it, but I know God's word is true even when my experience says not. Remember that truth we talked about? When what you see with your eyes is in conflict with God's word, I always choose God's word. Always. And and you know what? My feelings right now are in contradiction or in conflict with what the word of God says over my life. The inadequacy is never on God's part. Hold on to this, people. It's never on God's part. The inadequacy is always on my part because I'm fallible, I'm human, I'm broken. So you know what I do? I get on my knees and I pray and I say, God, where are you? God, I can't feel you right now, but you never forsake me. God, I might feel like I'm dying. You've brought life. you set the captives free. I know right now you're, you're doing a work on my part. And you know what? When I'm in pain, I pray more than I've ever prayed. I'm on my knees more than I've ever been on my knees. And, and God starts to expand my heart. He does. You know, today, having gone through season after season like that, I, I, like, guys, I get it. I get the humanity. I get the brokenness. And you know what? My heart for people who struggle with depression and anxiety has grown because I've been there, done that, and I'll do it again next year. Like, uh, we got a date. Like, I'm ready for this. And, and you know what, man? My, my devotions are so rich. And then it all goes away. Summer comes. And you know what, God? I'm sorry. I'm going fishing today, God. <laughs> oh, you need help? After I go on my hike. And you know what ends up happening? I get caught up in life. I do, and, 
And you know what? I anchor into, when I'm hurting, I anchor into the things of God. Because God promises to meet me in my mess, not rescue me from my mess. I've actually learned to thank God for the seasons I'm in. God's done a work in my life. My heart for others has, has grown. You know what's been beautiful? My need for Jesus grows exponentially in my times of pain. I need Jesus. I need Jesus today. I don't need him tomorrow. I need him today to get to tomorrow, and I'm going to need him then too. But I'm not thinking about tomorrow. I'm not thinking about plans I have ahead. I'm thinking about Jesus. I want a rich relationship with you today. My nose is in my word. My heart is in worship. And you know what? I'm in your palm, Jesus. And you know what else is brought about in my life? Humility. It's brought about tremendous amounts of humility. And it's kept me in my head out of those clouds. Because I got a thorn in my flesh. Just like Paul. You remember Paul had that thorn in his flesh and some people speculate, well, maybe it was his vision. He was going blind. He was like, oh, I wrote this letter with my own hand, period. And everybody clapped. Like, you did that. <laughs> Sorry, Paul, if you're listening. God does a work. And you know what? So here's this guy. He prayed, healed people. The apostles, they, they raised the dead. Scripture says that their shadow would be cast on sick people as they walk by. Demons would come out. People would get healed. And he couldn't heal himself. Because you know what? Sometimes we fight against the hand of God, folks. Sometimes when something difficult happens, something hard happens, did you not think it was God's will for your life to bring about a change in a circumstance that only the pain could? It's a vehicle. And you know what Jesus told him? In your weakness, I'm made strong. You see, sometimes God wants to make you weak so that he can be strong and mighty in your life. And that's a promise you and I can anchor into. I want you to stop for a moment and think about the thing that is stressing you most in your life. What is stressing you most right now? Think about that. Or who? Right? It's either a place, a pace, a person, a pandemic, or a provision. Place, place, person, pace, pandemic, or provision. It's one of those five areas of your life that are stressing you, but here's a hard truth. Your problem is not what you think it is. Your problem isn't them. It's not what's in your pocket. Your problem is, I don't want him to be the prince of my peace. I want him to be my genie like Aladdin. And you know what's funny? When God doesn't do what we want, we get upset and we get angry we treat him like a genie, but if that relationship were really how it worked, who would be the God and who would be the servant? See, that's the arrogance, the pain, the brokenness of the human condition. And I'm just like all of you, I struggle with that. So what do I do? I humble myself. And what does the season of pain bring to my life? It brings humility. My problem is not my problem. My real problem is my unrealistic expectations of God. Unrealistic expectations of God. So what do I know? God is good even when life isn't. Like, I know that. I stand on that. Man, I got the seasonal blues right now. And God is still good when I feel depressed. You know how hard it was today coming in, worshiping with you guys? And Pastor Dave was praying, is there somebody right now who needs a touch from God? I'm like, God, it's me. I need a touch from you right now because I'm about to get up there and I got to deliver a message I so desperately want to feel. I believe it, but I don't feel it, God. I know God's good even when life isn't. We may never know why bad things happen. So you know what I do? I anchor into trust. I lean into the trust of God. This world's going crazy, folks, right? But when you read the Bible, the book of Revelation, it's probably going to get a little bit worse, right? So when we say, God, stop it. Why are these things happening? What we have to realize is this. It's only going to get worse. God in his sovereignty allowed it to get worse. If I'm, trying to, if I'm getting so upset about the way the world's going, maybe I'm fighting the hand of God. Maybe I need to trust that God is allowing the pain, the growing pains, the birthing pains to bring about his purpose in this, in this world. So you know what I do? I stop questioning and I start trusting. When my eyes don't match up to his word, I always trust his word and not what my eyes see. Always. God promises good from the bad. There's something you and I, guys, we have to stand on that, that truth, right? God doesn't waste your pain. You know how much comfort I have? Seasonal affective disorder, the winter blues. Like God doesn't waste it. It's rich. I'm, you know, I don't, I don't journal. I'm not a writer, really. You'd be like, dude, you're a pastor. Come on, you got to preach every week. But, and, and I have to write, right? But for my own personal well-being as part of my, my self-care, my spiritual walk, I'm not a journaler. But man, I write like crazy this time of year. It's rich. 
God is so rich. God is so real to me. And, and there's moments, I, would, I kid you not, there's moments when, the sum, when I'm in the summer and I look back on these days and I'm like, I have to stop everything I'm doing to purposely and intentionally position myself for that experience with God again because God, I'm getting wrapped up with life. I look forward to the stillness. And that's what pain in our life does, folks. It quiets things. It puts things into perspective. You know, when this pandemic struck, all I cared about, I didn't care about the lights or the quality of music. I was calling, emailing, texting all of you. Why? How are you doing? What's going on in your life? Who's sick that we need to pray for? How can we, the leadership, I know Esther was there, the other pastors were there, Genesis in the back was like, all of us were talking and in communication. If I missed you, I'm sorry if you were there, you were there. And we were interceding. Why? Because when life gets hard, somehow life makes more sense. Guys, we were living in the matrix. 90 miles an hour, living life, passing us by. Somebody says, hey, let's get together. Let's get lunch. Oh, yeah, yeah, we could do that. Text me. And how many of you know we made broken promises today? I'm like, oh, snap. They want to do coffee or a virtual meeting. I'm going to make time for that because I don't know what tomorrow brings. Relationships are more rich. But you know what? We're not the only people who have missed that. We're not. We're human. And it's part of our condition. But you know, the apostles missed it too, and they were with Jesus in that moment. In his earthly ministry, these group of guys and a whole lot of other people following him around saw him raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons, feed thousands, miracle after miracle after miracle. And you know what they missed in that moment? That they were in the presence. They got so caught up with everything going on, sometimes it doesn't sink down into the heart. And they missed something so important that he is God, that he's in control of everything, that nothing happens by accident. And the things that do happen that may not be God's perfect will and desire for your life, he will still use for good. And they were wrapped up with fear. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 to 27. After ministry, it's that boat, one of the first boat moments. Then he got into the boat with his disciples, uh, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a, fur a fur ah, furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. Wait a minute. That, that's going to rock somebody's theology. You mean if I follow Jesus, I'm still going to find myself in a storm? Right? If I follow Jesus, hardship is still going to come my way? Why do we follow Jesus? For the promises? For the relationship? for the wholeness, for the forgiveness. Like, have you ever asked yourself that? Why do you say yes to Jesus? And if you're tuning in for the first time today and you don't know what you believe about God, I'm sure you've heard certain things. This is what the Word shows us, that even when you follow Jesus, life may be hard, but in Jesus, with Jesus, you're never alone because he enters into your pain. See, that's a promise. When you go through hardship in this life, do you ever stop and wonder, how do people who don't have hope in, in God trust in God? How do they get through it? Man, I've grieved people that passed, people on their deathbed, and I'm like, God, if it weren't for you, how in the world would I get through this? My rescuer, my redeemer, God, you're going to use my pain. You know the comfort I take in following Jesus, one of the many, that whenever I'm hurting, he promises to use this. It's not wasted. But without God in my life, it's just a waste. It's just wasted. So, so here they are following Jesus and it walks them into a storm. A storm of purpose, we're going to call it. But Jesus was sleeping. Say, sleepy Jesus. Do you ever feel like sleepy Jesus was sleeping on you? <laughs> like, take a moment and think about that. God, I'm in pain. I'm hurting. I'm praying to you. And dude, you taking a nap in the boat? And that's what was going on. Like, like look at the chaos. Like, there's chaos happening. The, the world around them is raging. They're in fear for their lives. They're about to die as they perceived it. And Jesus was at a place of such peace, a place of such rest. It didn't face him. He was sleeping in the boat. And the disciples, they went, they went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Do you not know who's in your boat? Who's in your boat? Why are you so afraid? Do you know who's not in your boat? You thought you were in a storm. 
What you really don't recognize is that you are in the presence of peace because you will never know the peace of God unless you're in the storm first. He will never enter into your pain unless you have pain. And it's in those moments of pain that I've come to know and understand Jesus as a Savior in a way that I never would have without the pain. And, and that's, what is, that's what this moment is with these apostles. Save us, we're going to drown. Why are you afraid? Don't you know that I knew this storm was coming? Don't you know I, I told you get in the boat and follow me into the storm? This storm has purpose. This storm is going to build you. Whatever your hardship is today, what you need to know is it didn't take God by surprise. God is not surprised by your pain. He's not surprised by your struggles in your relationships, by your financial situation. It did not take him by surprise. He is completely sovereign. Now you might be saying, well, pastor, we live in a fallen world. Isn't God good? Yes, he's good. But what God allows, what we experience, we don't always experience as good, but his will is always good. And that's what you and I got to hold on to. Don't you realize who is in your boat? You thought you were in a storm, but in reality, you are in the presence of peace. Then he got up, verse 26. He rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. You see, it's in those moments where some of us met Jesus as Savior. Pastor, I was at rock bottom. I was ravaged by drugs and addiction. I lost my kids. I lost my family. I opened my heart to God, and boom, in that moment, My life was changed. I was made a new creation. You see, it's in that moment he calms the sea and the storm, and they're like, oh, snap, who is this dude we're with? Who's in our boat? Like, hello, guys, it's Jesus. You just, you you saw him save people. You, You saw him heal people, bring life to dead people. Did you think he wouldn't do it for you? And some of us feel that way, even us who are in ministry. Like, man, I've been in ministry. Some of you are in ministry. And the truth is, if you're a follower of Jesus, let me break it to you, you're a minister of the Word of God. Every follower of Jesus is a minister. You you bring the light of the world with you. And, And you know what? You've seen Jesus. You've heard Jesus. You've heard stories of him doing all this. And now you doubt that he's going to do it on your behalf. You see, sometimes I don't doubt that he's going to do it on my behalf. Sometimes I just don't want to go through the pain. Like that, that's the truth, right? Let, let's be real here. I, I just don't want to go through the pain. But I have to trust that the pain is purposed by God to do something in my life nothing else will. Because the promise goes back to Zechariah's song to shine on those living in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into peace. This life is void of peace. But we can anchor today into the truth that when you find yourself in a storm, you are actually in the presence of peace. But how? Right? So many times on a Sunday morning, we talk about all these promises of God. We talk about things we should be doing, but nobody ever tells us how. Look, I don't know if there's a fully, complete right answer. I'm going to tell you what I do, what works for me. Because it's about trust. You all know what a mantra is, right? It's a thing we repeat over and over and over. When when I'm walking into the unknown, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, the psalmist says, I will fear no evil because you are with me. And you know what I say? God, I trust you even when the world is raging around me. God, I trust you through this pandemic. God, I trust you through this diagnosis. I trust you through this loss. I trust you through this difficulty. You will never leave me or forsake me. I lean into the trust of God and I claim it over and over and over until my heart starts to grow and I start to feel this peace around me. Because here's the thing, who you open your ears to will influence how you live your life and what you feel. Thoughts, are leaders. What is leadership? It's influence. The thoughts I allow to, produ- to fill my mind, to fill my, my lips, are going to be the thoughts that influence how I feel. But you know what? I don't repeat what the world says. I don't repeat what my eyes see. I repeat what his word says. Guys, and I do it every day. I anchor in deep to the promises of God. I want to encourage you identify one or two promises of God in the right context because we could grab scriptures and like use them how we want. You you don't want to do that. There's promises God made you. Stand on those. Make it your life verse. Man, I used to, back in the day, I used to have a flip phone and I used to be able to put like a statement in the front. So every time I flipped it, I saw it. And you know what it would say for years? It said, God is good. 
Simply, that's all it said. God is good. Man, I started in 2005 as a mental health counselor. And do you know every day I needed to realize God is good? Man, I was dealing with vicarious trauma, victims of abuse, like you name it, PTSD, horrible things I was hearing in people's lives. And I needed to flip that phone. Sometimes I would flip it and you couldn't scroll anything, right? There was no like computer in that baby. Like I would just flip it just to see those words. God is good. I anchored into a promise of God. Man, I believe often, and I, and I speak it often, God brings purpose to your situation, brings purpose to your pain. We've all sang that song, Jesus, Take the Wheel. You guys don't want me to start doing that because I can't sing. I, I got a voice only my God could love, okay? But I will tell you, like, the battle really is his. It really is the Lord's. Like, do we really give that battle to God? So what do I do in self-accountability when I'm fighting? I remind myself, I speak it, I give it to God. God, my troubles are yours. God, my pain is yours. My difficulty is yours. I might be surrounded by giants in my life, but like the psalmist, man, I'm looking at Goliath, but he's small in comparison to my God. You see, when you look at your problems and you look at the giants in your life and you get intimidated, you, is your God really this tiny? No, I stop and I remind myself that if God did it for David, he's going to do it for me. But pastor, you don't understand. My giant is bigger than what David fought. Bigger than what David dealt with. What giant in your life is too big for your mighty God? I remind myself of that truth. I anchor into that truth. And you know what? When I can't anymore, when I can't walk, when I can't stand, and you guys know I'm real. We don't play the church face in this church. We don't. I call some of you. I anchor into my community. And when I don't know what to pray, can you pray with me? Can you pray for me? When I'm too weak to pray, I come alongside you guys. I ask you to pray. Remind me of the things of God. Do you know what the church of Jesus has done in my life? I could literally talk 10 messages on that. How the church, not in its dysfunction, right? Every church is a hospital. There's one physician. His name is Jesus. But when the church is done right with the cross at its core, the church is beautiful. Church has always been there for me. And then scripture says this, the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Say the other side. So what they didn't know in that storm is that these dudes were going to the other side. You see, on the end of your storm, there's always another scene. There's always another moment. There's always another chapter. And you see, this storm was actually preparing them for what these dudes were about to walk into. Now, if you've seen scary exorcist movies, you shouldn't watch them. They're demonic. But if you have, this is that moment, okay? They get to the other side, and Scripture says, and we're going to look at Mark because I like the way Mark describes it better, right? Scripture says that there was this demonically possessed guy, and he was in a bad shape. He was in the storm of his life, and he was fully and completely taken over by a demonic spirit. He no longer had control over his being. Mark 5, verse 3, this man lived in the tombs, and no one can bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart, broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. This guy was at the worst place you could ever imagine. God entered into his mess. God rescued him in his mess, set this guy free. And the apostles, could you imagine? They're... they're Listen, on the boat, that's scary, but I've been. I've been on a boat in bad weather. I would freak out much more on the other side than I would in the boat. So they're watching this, and you know what the Bible doesn't say? They didn't lose their head about this thing. They didn't start getting all stressed. They didn't start saying, Jesus, you're sleeping on us again. Like, all of a sudden, they were like, wait a minute. What he just did over here for us, man, you know who I'm with? He was like, you ever seen those cartoons? It's like the little dogs are acting all tough because the big dog's behind them. Like they were coming out with their chest popped out because I'm walking with the Lord. You're not a victim of this life. Jesus walks with you. Puff, puff out your chest. So they went in all tough. Now you know Jesus did all the work, right? They were just riding on his coattails just like you and I do. Because at the end of the day, long before I'm a pastor, I'm a broken follower of Jesus. At the end of the day, that's what you are. And you know what? 
The same healing God does in my life, he does for you and for them. And one encounter with Jesus, guys, it changes everything. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away, began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. You see, that's the power of the storm. I thought I was in a storm, but I was really in the presence of peace. And in that moment, you guys have to, you have a choice. Anchoring in is a choice, folks. Do I anchor into the storm and all the problems and the anxieties? Or do I anchor into what the Word of God says? Do I anchor into the presence of peace in the midst of the storm? Because there's a blessing, guys. I said this over and over. There's a blessing in that pain, in that difficulty. You will never discover who you're really meant to be on that mountaintop. Where we want to stay, where we like to worship God, where we like to come into church with that happy Christian church smile on, with our Christianese lingo, and we like to play that persona, it's not where you discover your purpose. It's not where you discover Jesus as your friend, your passion, your destiny, what you were called and meant to do, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You see, it's never on the mountaintop that you learn your peace, your purpose, passion, or your destiny. It's always in the presence of peace, surrounded by a storm. You will only come to know the presence of peace when you anchor into it in the midst of a storm in your life. And you've come into this service today in person, online, podcast, either in a storm, about to walk into a storm, or you've just walked out of one. But I want to give you guys three questions to ask yourself that will help you to anchor in as we wrap up this message. What is God using this for? How might he be preparing me for the other side? How might he redeem my situation? You see, there's a truth and a promise for you and I today, God will never bring you to what he's not faithful to bring you through. You and I have to hold that truth. God will never bring you to what he's not faithful to bring you through. Guys, life is hard, but you and I, we have to anchor in. We have to anchor in deep to the things of God, knowing that he is faithful, that he is good. And when we're in a storm, reality is we're in the presence of peace. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, God, that it's not the storms that we're in, though we often think we are in a storm. It's actually we're in the presence of peace. May we anchor into you, Jesus. May we apply the truths we've learned over this message series. I pray especially for the person right now who's coming to this message feeling far from you, God. Lord God, you couldn't have made it easier. Your word tells us to believe in our heart that Jesus is the son of God who died for our sins and rose from the dead, that he is the son of God. And when we confess that with our mouths, we're saved. If you want a relationship with Jesus, it's that easy. Confess that. God, I believe you're the son of God who died for my sins on that cross, paid my debt. I believe you rose from the dead. I place my trust in you. If you pray that, the Bible says you're saved. Lord God, I pray, Jesus, you would bless that person who has needed that outpouring from you today. In your name, Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, what's up? My name is Armando. I'm the pastor of Fusion Church, and we are so excited that you followed along in this message. We hope that you enjoyed this message. If you did, make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button down below. If you feel led by God to support the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do that in a number of ways. Number one, pray for us, pray with us. God is doing some great things here at Fusion Church, and that is probably the best way for you to be part of it. The second way is if you live locally, please come out and visit us. Come, uh, come and enjoy service with us. And if you feel led to, you can even join our team and become a teammate. And the third way is if you feel led by God to give to the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do so by going to our website, www.fusionchurchny.com and hit the giving tab. With that being said, guys, God bless you. Hope you enjoy the next message.